So anyway, thank you uh, both. Um, um, maybe just a gigantic question <laughs> for um, maybe not alluded to in both your talks, but um, is this, which is um, just the larger issue of the kind of cor uh, correlation or parallels of scientific curiosity and aesthetic curiosity. So maybe for Andrew, how are they similar? And for Naomi, um, uh, what are the aesthetic considerations for your scientific research? I know those are gigantic, but I, I noted about four or five times that you used, Naomi used the word visual or um, visually um, gratifying. You used, used that a lot. And I think probably for all of us, you know, we, we, we kind of got it when we saw like the, the graphs with different colors, you know, so anyway. Right. <laughs> well, I think in choosing an organism to study, I, I confess, I, you know, there, I, the, the whole world is out there, but um, I probably gravitated to, to insects, certainly to butterflies, but then uh, ants because of their fascinating behavior, and, uh, and now um, moths because of their uh, crypticity and, and fascinating behavior. Uh, uh, but aesthetics surely comes into mm. it. I, I figure if, <laughs> you, if you're going to spend your whole life studying something, it might as well be something that you like looking at it. Uh, but I'm, I'm sorry to be sad to trivialize it, but, and, and, you know, but on the other hand, uh, you know, I think, uh, I, I think yeah, it's I mean, you a motivator. Probably, of course um, it's a motivator. Probably there are many other scientists who are also compelled by what they're looking at every day, you know, whatever, even if it's like the guts of the, yeah. the birds, and, you know, and, you know, I mean, that led you, Andrew, to um, kind of keep going, like what's inside right. there, and then, you know, kind of, mm -hmm. yeah. So, right, um, yeah. No, and that one point to that that I'm just curious about with mutualism, too, is like I'm not sure whether as the artistic, you know, this idea of this being an art project, then I'm the subject who's the creative agent, but I wonder to what extent you know, why am I collecting all of these seeds kind of obsessively? Mm -hmm. I wonder to what extent I, I might not also even be being paratized, parasitized by these plants oh. <laughs> as opposed to, We're you being know. mutualized. Yes. Yeah, the I other. mean, maybe it's a mutualism uh, in one sense, but maybe right. it's a parasitism. Like, there's something compelling. There's something aesthetically compelling about these um, creatures uh, from this natural history perspective, right. I suppose. There's a different, but also is, but what's interesting is I'm not that, I'm also as trained as a zoologist, first in butterflies and then ants also. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why I'm so interested in plants right now. So that's kind of interesting. And yeah. that gets to your question, I mean, about, I think, um, you know, if I were working as a sci looking at that in terms of the scientific aesthetic, I think I would feel obligated to research it and be thorough about it in mm -hmm. a very certain kind of way, but I can engage in certain kinds of play, certainly with um, with the, these systems that I couldn't um, if I was really taking it on as a right. as in a scientific <laughs> right. project versus an artistic project. Right. And that's where <laughs> I'm trying to advocate for this idea of the natural history of being the, sort of the, the hybrid compromise, mm -hmm. where it can still be informed by these certain kinds of forms of knowledge, like the evolutionary anachronism, or um, but it's still driven and motivated still also by like the personal and with things that mm -hmm. allow for play or mm -hmm. paradox, but those are things you wouldn't be allowed to right. engage in the right. same way. I mean, you're, it seems, Andrew, you have much. Love yeah, I, love it. <laughs> I think play is important. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, well, I do. I mean, yeah. I don't think, uh, and I wish that all, all students would uh, explore it. Uh, that's a pretty deep passion to rear out all those seeds uh, mm -hmm. because um, it's, a, it's a lot of work, but. I think. Right. Uh, well, it seems like there's so. definitely a parallel for the artists in the audience, you know, with that kind of obsession with that, you know, you, you get up every the next day and, you know, you must do whatever it is, um, collecting or whatever. Uh, it just, you know, you end up with two different outcomes or, mm -hmm. or different kinds of outcomes. Um, yeah. Um, I have Sorry. a slightly more uh, philosophical uh, feeling about the mutualism aspect too, and uh, so um, uh, the, the seeds manipulating Andy's behavior, or uh, I don't know how many of you saw the cover of a uh, Science when uh, when they had the dog looking out very lovingly out of this cover picture, but the article inside was about how the dog is tapping into. 
um, uh, oxytocin responses in, in humans, so um, uh, to manipulate their, their the host or the the owner uh, by eliciting <laughs> eliciting the same sort of responses that you you have from um, raising children or you know right. gazing deeply into each other's right. eyes or um, and uh, there there uh, this this is a viewpoint that is very common for people who study mutualism or cooperation is that it may be better viewed as a reciprocal parasitism so. Um, hmm. Um, so e with each, with the kind of salesmanship and um, uh, escalating um, coevolution of one one party manipulating the, the other, and then the other one getting over those uh, barriers and now manipulating back, and uh, I, I do find I've. It's it's hard to say no. That's not what happens um, because, uh, in fact, we see evidence all over the place in cooperative systems of mu of manipulation mm -hmm. taking place. But, but uh, for my philosophical <laughs> note on this, this is one reason why I very much like. Uh, um, looking at evolutionary history and looking at phylogenetic trees, because when we look at um, uh, something like the phylogeny of the of the Lycenidae, we find that this the explicit parasitism that is those species that are eating the ants they they fool the ants chemically to be taken into the nest where they either eat them or fed mouth to mouth. Those, those are taxa that are evolutionary dead ends in the sense that they, re, they result in a reduction of uh, species and over time they, they look like they're on their way out. And, uh, and so it makes me feel optimistic that the ones that appear to uh, be mutualistically associating with each other where the caterpillars provide food and the ants pro provide uh, protection, those are the ones where we see these big radiations taking mm -hmm. off. And so from that evolutionary uh, evidence, I would say, no, uh, OK, I understand that we can view this as reciprocal parasitism, but I'm not so cynical about it, because I actually think that in, in most cases, it is mutualism. And in some, some instances, it can turn to parasitism. But, but actually, uh, uh, on balance, we often see mutualism resulting in a very creative uh, uh, hmm. diversification. And reinforcing. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. right. So we, we've talked about, Andy and I have talked a bit about these, uh, these are the sorts of things that interest both of us, I think. That's a... um, so I actually have a question, uh, or maybe a related question for you, Nomi, which is, um, like, what, how do you feel, or how do you respond to Andrew's kind of sort of shift from, you know, pure science to kind of this kind of art making out of science? Oh, I think I'm just it's great. Yeah, <laughs> really. Be honest. Yeah, no, sure. No, I think it's great. Except yeah. that, well, the diff Well, there is a difference, which is that I want him to to catalog all those plants that come out of the gut so that yeah. we, can, yeah. we can look at them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because there's really, there's, there's quite a lot of scientific uh, evidence there that's, that's interesting. And, very, and few people have taken the time to do something like that. Look at what germinates better when it comes out of a bird gut, and also how that may vary depending between individuals and across species. Right, yeah. So that would be my difference. But in terms of the idea of making out, art out of it, I think it's great. <laughs> Um, I would invite the audience, maybe if anybody has a question or comment, because um, I don't want to run too, too late. So um, Megan is right over there. She's bringing a mic to right here. OK. Oh, thank you both. That was a really interesting um, um, you know, presentation from both of you. I was wondering, uh, you know, Naomi, you're speaking to a kind of uninformed audience about biology, and um, and and one thing I was I was really curious about with the two of you is that, you know, you're using a, a set of data visualizations that have their own kind of vocabulary that has evolved greatly. You know, what we use now versus 10, 20 years ago is mm. totally different, and so that is a kind of transmission of a set of like, you know, it's evidence, it's um, also, but a set of imaginaries too, because we have to sort of fantasize about how many mm. ants there are and the kind of history of this and, um, and the kind of evolutionary biology that, that's occurring. And that seemed to be a little bit analogous towards um, you know, Andrew's visual propositions, which again, point to a set yeah. of imaginaries for the audience to kind of engage with. I, I totally believe that. I think for p pedagogy, for or to actually teach, uh, I, I always <laughs> use a lot of uh, imagery, or I try to um, imagine uh, 
So I was thinking, oh, okay, I'm going to talk about lysine as an ants and how maybe the, the, the caterpillars are manipulating the, the ants. But nothing replaces actually seeing the, yeah. the, the caterpillar tapping yeah. on the yeah. mandibles of the ants. I mean, this is, then you go away with that and you remember it. Um, so it, it's, uh, to me, it's incredibly important the, that interplay of uh, the real natural history is, is, is essential. Um, and it's funny, but uh, there, there are many students, I have many students who will not do this, and I, you know, I, <laughs> we, have to, we have practice talks about the research that they're doing, and, they're, and, and everything is sort of stylized or put over in a little box, and, 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 hmm. and, and it sort of strangles, you know, without, without a sense of nature. And I, hmm. so I try, I try to kind of break that down, because I think that no, people will not go away remembering what the story was if they can't sort of see the story. Mm -hmm. So, so, but how that interfaces with art, I, I, <laughs> I, I am a very literal person. <laughs> yeah. Hi there. I'll just project. No, I think you have oh. to do it to record. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, good. good. Could you uh, both reflect on this concept of making the invisible visible in terms of your science practice and your mm -hmm. art practice? Because I think, well, I, at least from this talk, I picked up that there's a, a really clear relationship in terms of science practice and art practice there. Do you want to start? I, I think that's true. Mm -hmm. um, I don't do very well with things that I can't see. That, that has meant that uh, my, my entry into molecular biology has been a little slow, because I, 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 I tend to do experiments over and over again just to make sure that, that I can believe them. But if I can't see it, it's hard. Mm -hmm. And uh, one example with these um, uh, ants and the bacteria, we spent an awful lot of try time trying to get this, uh, a technique called FISH to work, where you, it's a fluorescence technique to where you can visualize the bacteria and where they're embedding in the, in the guts of the ants. And I, this was terribly important to me, to, uh, even visualizing the fluorescence of how many bacteria are there. Um, uh, I, I do, I, to me, it's very, it's very important. but. Uh, and I also think that it can contribute to the science because um, I, who expected? We didn't expect. I know John didn't expect such you know orders of magnitude, the difference in numbers of bacteria between the ones that were were um, very functional versus the ones that may just be by you know traveling through, as it were. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I think it connects to that idea too. That certainly, I mean, maybe it's it's. Um, it's obvious to say, but that artistic and scientific practices share this a deep sense of curiosity, which is like the visual, the making the visi making things visible in part is about sort of the underlying why. Like, what's the invisible thing that's happening? That you know, what's the sort of underlying causality? Like, and you know, that might be matter in motion kind of causality, or it might be you know, um, it might be emotions and affect and semiotics. But there, there are these things that are running through underneath, right? What you otherwise take for the surface of things, if you if you don't look closely or if you don't inquire, and so it, may, it makes me think. I don't know if you've seen. There's this really great um, primatologist at Louisiana State named um, Povinelli, and and um, he I saw him. I, I you know I'm interested in his papers. He does stuff around a chimpanzee cognition. But I, I I saw this documentary recently called Surviving Progress. Have you heard this? Or it's kind of a strange documentary. But one thing. The, the documentary starts with Povinelli showing his chimps that he, take, he always compares adult chimps and, and five-year-old human children. But there's this um, certain kind of L-shaped bar that you can prop up. And you can, if you put it on the circle and balance it, you get a banana or you get an M&M, &M, depending on which species you are. And, um, but then he has mm -hmm. a, a trick one that's weighted at the end. And so whenever you try to balance it, it falls over. And, he's a, and one thing that turns out to be the case is, I don't mean to be very specious in this, ki in this, but this is where he goes with it. But I think it's fundamental, this question of underlying curiosity and visibility. It's like, you know, the chimpanzee will give up after two times, but he's like a human child will like continue to try to stand this thing up for like an hour. <laughs> and he's like, and anyway, then his narrative comes on to be like, that's what's fundamentally different about, and I don't know if I agree with that, what's fundamentally different about humans versus chimpanzees, but I think it, Practical. yeah, <laughs> but there's something about, you know, clearly there, even the gesture of doing this, there's this other visualization that's probably internal, mm. but trying to make this other invisibility make sense mm. that that's happening in the way that this child continues to practice with 
right? It almost makes a tool out of the thing that's confounding uh, the child that the chimpanzee isn't doing it in the same way, I would argue. But I mean, I think that's, that might get to that question of the visibility. I know we're, we're both very interested in, um, in this notion of private channels. Yeah. So one of the, some of the work going on in my lab now is uh, looking at uh, the wings of butterflies and moths and uh, looking at wavelengths that we don't see ourselves. So, so uh, scanning across um, all the, uh, all the taxa, so a really broad survey of the distribution of UV reflectance, fluorescence, um, long wavelength, uh, so off the end of the red that we can't see or into the near infrared. Um, these, are, these are things that really fascinate me right now because I'm guessing that, uh, that, there, that it will also um, tell us something about perception, uh, insect perception that we mm. are unaware of because we don't have it ourselves. Um, this, I, I think it's a theme that runs through all the, mm. all the things I've studied because that, that's where I wonder if, like, because scientific instrumentation is supposed to do that, right? Basically extend the visibility or per perceptivity, right, mm -hmm. of, of what you're limited with. The instrumentation right. sort of extends your umwelt or your, yes. your perceptive sphere, right? And I do think that you could make a metaphorical argument that the artistic, the, the project, the artwork is, is an instrument, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe not instrumentation, but the instrument right. by which you are, again, trying to, right, expand that cone of perceptibility, but in a more nuanced way, it isn't simply about detection. I think, again, it's also about sort of affect and, and um, evocation. It's about evoking also from within, not just the detection from without. But I think the same idea applies in terms of this question of the instrumentation or the sensitivity, right? Because the mm. aesthetic means like, oh, it comes from the Greek for like awareness. And so it's, these, it's trying to potentiate these different kinds of awareness, I think that is also in common that you don't see in other disciplines uh, that aren't art and science in the same way. The real focus on potentiating awareness or the sensitivity towards, again, that underlying invisible that you mentioned, I think is like, is crucial. I think we have time for one more because we are running really late. One more question. How about two? There's also a girl. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, uh, Andy, I think at the end of your talk, you were talking about how like, you, I'm gonna do a poor job paraphrasing this, forgive me, but I think you said something like evolutionary history can be thought of as like a, series or sequence of very unlikely things. Mm -hmm. And it dawned on me that like all of the trees in Naomi's talks are basically yeah. giving evolutionary histories. Do you, Naomi, ever think about like what e like each of those branch points, like where you get like a divergent, like you two like species come off of one. Like do you think about that as like a point in time? Do you think that like an event happened somewhere <laughs> on the planet? Like do you ever imagine <laughs> that and like Think about what there, that would have looked like. <laughs> there's, a, there's a way of plotting phylogenetic trees. It's called 10,000 trees, where you, because every one of those trees is a, it's a, it's a hypothesis, it's an estimation, where you run the algorithm, you know, over and over and over until you get you get some confidence interval on that node. But there's a way to the, where you can visualize that so that you, when you oh. see those branches, you can see that that it's actually made of a composite of, of many branches that sometimes went one way and sometimes went another. And uh, to me, those are a little bit more exciting than the <laughs> deterministic yeah. branch point. Oh, you know, the, 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 it's more the, the so Each scientific process. paper would be a thousand pages long, for <laughs> sure, every tree. <laughs> I guess that uh, last person with the mic. Um, you said, you showed a video <coughs> of a caterpillar getting milked by the ants, and you showed the tentacle. Yes. And I was wondering if the tentacle kept on popping out or if it was like a new one that got harvested by the ants or if it was just uh, No, one. yeah, it, that's a very good, it looks like that's what it's doing. But no, that's a, the different species have, uh, some of the tentacles are very sharp and brushy and some of them are, are flabby. And that one is sort of flabby and I don't, I, I don't know why um, we've we've looked a bit at the tentacles and they uh, secrete uh, compounds that are pheromones that are um, that disperse that uh, in the air, uh, volatile compounds. And I've always thought that they mimic ant alarm pheromones so that uh, they'll get they keep the ants very excited. The ant will sort of look up when the, when the when the tentacle comes out, um, and sometimes the ant will bite try to bite at it, uh, but um, but. 
uh, amazingly, uh, to this day, no, no um, not for a single species, the, the, uh, the uh, compound secreted by those tentacles has not been identified. So, uh, which, and that's not for a want of trying. People have tried. It's, it, it's just uh, whatever they're making, it's a very, so very small amount. And, uh, but it, give, it doesn't ever give away its tentacle. The caterpillar keeps no, its No, the ants do try and bite at them. But, uh, <laughs> the, the caterpillars have very thick skins, and uh, the, those tentacles are pretty tough. All right, I think we're going to end here formally. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming and thank you both for just terrific, um, yeah, thank you. great stuff. Um, so just to let you know, um, we're taking a break for the summer. Um, our next event will be September 15th at de the Decor of a Museum. Uh, we're calling it Between Wonder and the Monstrous with artists Sean Foley and Harvard Dream researcher uh, Deidre Barrett. Um, this is part of a program um, uh, for the exhibition curated by Sarah Montrose, uh, currently on view at the De Cordova called Overgrowth. And then I'd like you to save the date for our fundraiser November 3rd, which is called Charm Science. We're going to be sort of doing magic and science in some way at the Microsoft Nerd Center. And, um, if you join us in the uh, lobby, we're going to do, we'll have an informal reception and both our speakers will still be here to talk every, with everybody. So thank you for coming. Thank you.